Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to all of our participants today to this online dilemma lecture with Ms. Margarita Konaev. The lecture is titled Trusted Partners, Human Machine Teaming and the Future of Military AI. Welcome. My name is Claudia Klonowska and I'm the researcher at the ESSER Institute and it is my pleasure today to moderate this session. Um, the dilemma lecture series is organized within the context of the project uh, titled Designing International Law and Ethics into Military AI, uh, which is hosted at the ASER Institute. The project analyzes how to address the challenges raised by AI technology in the military context from a multidisciplinary perspective. And so we ask ourselves three main questions, the why, the where, and the how question. The why is why fundamentally human control over military technologies must be guaranteed where precisely the role of human agents must be maintained in particular to ensure legal compliance and accountability and then how to technically how to technically ensure that military technologies are designed uh, and developed within the ethical and legal boundaries the project is funded by nbo and it started last september and will run for another four years and so we're very glad within this context to welcome our speaker miss margarita Konaev, for our lecture uh, Rita is a researcher fellow at Georgetown Center for Security and Emerging Technology, uh, interested in military applications of AI and Russian military innovation. Uh, previously, she was a non-resident fellow with the Modern War Institute at West Point, a postdoctoral fellow at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Pennsylvania's Perry World House. And before joining CSET, she worked with a senior principal in the marketing and communications practice at Gartner. And Margarita is, uh, is well published. Uh, so she's, her research ranges topics from international security, armed conflicts, non-state actors, and urban warfare in the Middle East, Russia, and Eurasia. And she's published in journals from the Journal of Strategic Studies, um, the Defense One, War on the Rocks, Law, Law for um, Journal of Global Security Studies, and many, many more. Um, so we're very, very happy to have you, Margarita, here with us today. Um, your, uh, your lecture series today will be on trusted partners. In other words, it will discuss the role and future of trust in human machine teaming in the context of the military AI technologies. Um, so just for some logistical details for our participants today, um, the lecture will take about 40 minutes, after which we'll have uh, the time for Q&A. So we very much encourage you to post your question already even during the presentation in the chat function. I will then gather those questions and post them to our speaker at, during the Q&A session. And again, thank you uh, all again very much for attending. And I think this is the time to give you the floor, Rita. Thank you so much, Claudia. Uh, let me share my screen just very quickly. Okay, and you can let me know if you are seeing my slides. I can see them now and I can hear you well. Excellent, perfect. All right, thank you so much for that introduction. And it really is such a pleasure to be here with you all this afternoon. I'm really looking forward to your questions. And I will just say really quickly that I was in The Hague in the Netherlands last year, uh, right before COVID started, and it was absolutely beautiful. And I would love to come back again. So hopefully I'll do a decent enough of a job that I'll get invited in person once more. All right, let's get started. So as Claudia mentioned, I work at the Center for Security and Emerging Technologies, which is part of Georgetown University. And there I lead our research on military applications of artificial intelligence. And when I started, I quickly got a sense that the public debate in this area tends to be dominated by the sense of doom and gloom and impending rollout of fully autonomous weapons, the complete delegation of authority to killer robots, the invention of robot tanks that are going to be running amok on the field of the battlefield of the future, on the very near future, really, where humans are essentially absent from the decision cycle and from the control cycle, and robots are making life and death decisions instead of us. 
So I don't mean to, you know, say this slightly by any means, of course, the integration of autonomy and military applications of artificial intelligence have very compelling and more and important ethical and moral and legal implications. There's no doubt about it. But my sense uh, was and still remains to a great extent that part of the public debate is very much dominated by this hype and to an extent a lot of fear and dram dramatization of what autonomy, what autonomy and AI um, can do in the male sphere and are already doing. So we at CISA decided to go ahead and launch a pretty significant project that actually looked more specifically into the data behind some of these questions. So we explored US military investments in autonomy and artificial intelligence, looking at uh, Department of Defense budgetary data, then focusing on the military capabilities these technological advancements are meant to enable and connecting them to strategic issues and strategic uh, implications in areas such as deterrence, military effectiveness, and interoperability with our allies. So, one of the key findings out of that research, and if you're interested, uh, we can talk about it more in the Q&A, but it's also available on our website online. But this is to say that one of the key findings out of our research into US military investments and research that's related to autonomy and artificial intelligence is that it's quite different from this hype of the public discourse about fully autonomous weapons and AI runs amok empowering killer robots. In fact, there is a very consistent and cross-cutting focus on human machine teaming. So instead of replacing or displacing humans, we are witnessing, at least within the Department of Defense, research that is focused on advancing intelligent technologies that interact, that collaborate, and that integrate with soldiers and operators in different ways for the purposes of optimizing performance both for the humans and for the human machine teams across different environments and in different missions. So we looked into autonomy and AI applications that are related to different unmanned systems, to information processing, to functionalities that are meant to enable decision support, as well as to the you know, uh, complicated and often controversial discussion of how autonomy and AI are going to function within the different steps of the targeting process, inevitably uh, you know, cu uh, culminating with the decision to engage uh, and kill or eliminate a target. And we've noticed, again, that human machine teaming was a factor in all of them, how people and machines work together, how they make decisions together, how people process information, how to share different tasks between human and machines without overwhelming the person and then using artificial intelligence and autonomy in ways that can help and augment human capabilities. So again, human machine teaming very much at the core of DOD's vision for artificial intelligence in the future. But even more so, as we're thinking about how AI is going to play out in the military and in military conflict, we also come came to notice that the US military has an even broader vision than just using human machine teams. In fact, DOD is investing in technologies that will enable machines that can function not just as tools that facilitate human action, but as trusted partners to human operators. And let me emphasize here this point about trusted partners because it's important. It tells us something not only about the fact that the machines themselves, that intelligence technologies themselves will become so advanced and so capable that they can play this role. But it also tells us that the relationship between human machines is changing in a fundamental way. And it's becoming something more akin to traditional teams, whether in sports or in conventional military units, the relationship between human and machines then that is built on trust conveys 
a progression in what was previously just assumed to be an interaction between humans and the tools that help them, you know, achieve certain actions. And really, when we're looking at these teams, when we're looking at different combinations between humans and technology, and when we're talking about the critical element that we know that is fundamental to success of teams, again, whether in sports and business or in the military, that critical element we all well know is trust. So today's conversation really is going to focus on that. I'm going to quickly elaborate on what trust is, how we define it, and how DOD is thinking about it. Then we'll talk about some of the research into unpacking this concept of trust, discussing different human attitudes towards technologies and some additional consideration. Then we'll go back and review the Department of Defense artificial intelligence, human machine teaming, and trust research. And let me start, let me kind of preview by saying that there are important gaps there that came as a surprise to us from some of our research. At the same time, then we'll emphasize, we'll explain what is the origins of these gaps and discuss what can be described as system engineering approaches that build trust for VAI by integrating trust into the system itself. And then I'll explain why such approaches are necessary, but are not sufficient for solving some of the issues and some of the problems that are related to trust in human machine teams. And we'll conclude if we have time by identifying and highlighting some of the future research directions that we suggest in some of our work. All right, let's get started. Just a second, excuse me. So what is trust? This is one of those questions, and I'm going to be posing a lot of the questions that simply don't have an easy solution. This is because research on human trust and generally human approaches and attitudes towards technology encompasses many fields. We're talking about engineering, computer science, cognitive sciences, organizational behavior, organizational psychology, even philosophy. All of these disciplines have different ways in which they define trust and different ways in which they measure trust and think about trust and interactions with to, between people and technology. So it's a multidimensional cross-disciplinary concept that is very difficult to define. So for the purposes of how we're thinking about it in the context of human machine teaming for our discussion today and for the research that we've been doing, we've been defining trust as an individual's confidence in the reliability of a system's conclusions and the system's ability to accomplish defined goals. So when you're looking at this definition, pay attention to the words like confidence and reliability and the ability to accomplish these defined shared goals. Because remember, what defines a team is the presence of shared goals. All right, now that we have a definition, let's kind of, you know, just ask quite plainly, why should the Department of Defense or the military in any country really that is working on human machine applications and integrating different intelligent technologies with people, why should they even care about trust? Well, most basically because trust is very important for effective human machine teams. Trust impacts the willingness of people to use, to collaborate with, and to rely on different intelligent technologies to accept their outcomes and to accept their recommendations. Without trust, it's not likely that all of these systems that the, you know, the Pentagon is building, that there a lot of other militaries are investing a lot of money in, it's not very likely that they'll be used, let alone used effectively. More broadly though, trust is also fundamentally important to the broader vision that the Department of Defense has in AI. And a lot of it traces back to the fact that the Department of Defense AI ethics principles that they adopted last year dictate that people in the end of the day are fundamentally responsible for the development, the use, and the outcomes of the AI systems that they employ in combat and in non-combat situations. So if I'm going to be responsible for something, of course I have to be able to trust it to make sure that it is used in safe and secure and effective and ethical ways. Otherwise, I don't wanna be responsible for something like that. I don't want to be responsible for something I cannot trust. 
right? So it makes sense when we're putting all of those elements together. All right, now that we kind of have a good sense of why should DOD care and what trust means, or at least how we define it, in our study um, called Trusted Partners, you know, uh, after which this conversation today is named, uh, we decided that we wanted to explore this question of trust and technology even you know, in, in greater depth and try to understand how different disciplines look into this question of human attitudes towards intelligence systems. And we were able to then see that a lot of researchers organize and classify trust into these three buckets, these three factors that affect how people relate to, interact with, and feel about technology. First, there's the issue of uh, dispositional trust that relates to people's inherent tendency to trust technology. So it's something that kind of comes instinctively and naturally. Then there's the question of situational trust that speaks to the impact of the broader environmental factors or where the person's mental state is at the moment or the nature of the task at hand. And finally, there's the learn trust, which deals with people's previous experience of technologies. So let's dive into all of these a little bit more closely and, uh, you know, get some examples, get some context here. So again, dispositional trust, the inherent tendency to trust or mistrust technology. We know that it's affected by a whole slew of factors, including demographic factors such as age or gender. So one interesting example comes from a survey of 18,000 adults across the world between the ages of 16 and uh, 64, showing that younger people tend to trust artificial intelligence more than older people. That is perhaps not surprising, and in many ways that, into, uh, that finding seems kind of straightforward, right? But at the same time, we could ask if this is a question of age or a question of a generation. Is it simply the fact that when you're young, you just tend to trust technology more, and when you grow older, you develop reservations and doubts? So that could be a question of age and maturity in a sense. On the other hand, this finding can also be reflecting the moment in time in which we are, which is quite unique because the younger generation has grown up with technology and has almost an instinctive uh, relationship with technology. If you've ever seen young children, even toddlers interact with an iPhone, it's something to watch. It comes, it's almost inbred, it's almost natural in them in many ways. So when these people, this younger generation is going to grow up, then going to get older and old, are these inclinations going to change or are they going to remain the same because they have always known technology? So even things that seem straightforward can still be quite complicated. Another set of factors that fall under dispositional trust speaks to personality traits. So it deals with how open you are to experiences, how agreeable you are, levels of you know, uh, things like uh, neuroticism, uh, just different levels of stress and different levels of, you know, just, uh, excuse me, uh, different reflections of personality. And all of these traits, again, impact how you approach technologies and how you interact with them. And finally here, there are cultural factors that are also important to highlight. So if we're going back to that survey that I highlighted earlier, that survey also found that about 70% of the respondents of the people that completed the survey in China said that they trust artificial intelligence. On the other hand, in the United States, only 25% of respondents said that they trusted AI. So clearly there's some sort of a cultural distinction here. On the other hand, there is also research that looks into trust and, and approaches and attitudes towards robots. And that study found that Americans actually have some of the most positive attitudes towards robots, while uh, Japanese people or Japanese respondents have some of the most negative attitudes. So that's an interesting comparison and an interesting contrast. And it really makes you wonder, could these results be associated, for instance, with American inclinations to openness and their, you know, just general societal uh, kind of tendency to be open to new experience and to want to meet new people and introduce new technologies? 
Or when we're looking at Japan, are we dealing with an apprehension across society about the role that robots are increasingly playing because of the demographic issues there? Whichever way it goes, we're really trying to illustrate here that these factors interact with one another and there are sometimes contradictory findings that raise important questions that we have to be thinking about across these different uh, drivers of trust and components of trust. Another area that's important to look into is this issue of situational trust, this other category that speaks into environmental factors, a person's mental state, and the nature of the task in hand. For example, we have research that shows us that people, when they're under high levels of stress or when they find themselves under emergency situations, they tend to overtrust technology. They tend to overtrust automation that provides them recommendations on tell them how to solve certain problems when they're under you know, emotional or um, cognitive stress. It's also something that we find with people when they're multitasking because it kind of, you know, there's a level of distraction there. You're managing a lot of things at once and you're not paying as much attention to everything that around you. Again, all of these situational factors affect trust. And finally, when we're talking about experience and past experience and past interactions with technology also fundamentally affect how we are going to approach the question of trust in machines. And here, once again, there are some contradictory insights, some mixed findings about the impact that training and experience can have on trust. On the one hand, it's pretty obvious that you need experience and you need to uh, familiarize yourself with whatever system that you're working with, that you're integrating with, uh, in order to be able to uh, do a good job and, uh, you know, use it safely. But at the same time, such familiarity and all of this experience, especially with highly reliable technologies that we can count on them to do their job, could also lead to some complacency and over-reliance on these technologies. So again, all of these interactions, all of these contradictions, important to pay attention to. And I think it also kind of builds the conversation towards the question of how much trust do we need in order to ensure that we have effective human machine teams. And once again, there is really no easy answer here because both too much trust and too little trust can be dangerous. And I made this joke earlier that there's really no better way to demonstrate how uh, the dangers of automation bias, then uh, I'm hoping at least some people in the audience are fans of The Office, that the joke doesn't fall completely on uh, deaf ears. But in this episode of The Office, uh, Michael just got a new GPS system and he's following it blindly and he's following the guidance of the GPS system that is clearly driving him into a lake. And Dwight keeps telling him, Michael, there is no road here. <laughs> you have to turn around, you have to turn around. And Michael is fully trusting the technology because the machine knows and ends up in the lake with his car. So you have to make sure that you establish the correct levels of trust in technology because clearly there are dangerous implications. Which brings it to the point about the calibration of trust, the issue that we have to identify the appropriate levels of trust, and that is depending on machine capabilities, what the intelligence technology can and cannot do, as well as the particular time that we're dealing with and the particular context that we're in, all right? So the question to how much trust is needed is very much, it depends. With this in mind, kind of now that we have, there's a few other points here that are worth mentioning, kind of additional considerations that we should all be keeping in mind when we're talking about trust um, in human machine teams. The first one is that it's not all about rationality. 
Trust and technology is also very much affected by emotional factors. How do you feel about the technology? What sort of emotions and sentiments does it evoke? Is it fear? Is it discomfort, confusion, aggravation? All of these factors then impact how you're going to approach this interaction in human machine teams, obviously. Another important point is that it's not only up to the individual. So we describe these dispositional, situational, and learned factors that have thus far focused on the individual. But of course, there's broader institutional societal structures and forces and things like organizational culture. All of these play a role in shaping us and our character and the concepts of operation around us, how we're expected to behave, and the rules of engagement in different areas. And all of this then translates to shaping trust in turn. Another point to recall here is that trust is not static. It is continuously evolving. And people keep changing and reevaluating trust based on their experience, the situation, how well or poorly the technology is doing. So it really is a dynamic concept. And related to that is worth remembering that trust really is not forever. And actually, there's a lot of research that shows that once a system malfunctions or, or uh, has an error or fails in some way, it's actually very difficult to rebuild trust again. And afterwards, people tend to evaluate the capabilities and the, um, you know, the abilities of the system much lower than warranted after it fails once. So in that way, uh, I think the you know, the issue of trust here is kind of similar to how it is in personal relationships that it's very much difficult to recover once some sort of, uh, you know, a brokerage occurs. All right, so now that we have this good understanding of what trust is, why DOD cares about it, the different components that make it up, how to think about trust calibrations and some of these additional considerations, let's go back to talking about what the Department of Defense is doing when it pertains to trust and understanding how AI is going to evolve and play a role in human machine teams. So like I mentioned in the big research that we did on US military investments in autonomy on AI, we looked into science and technology Technology program, which covers basic applied and advanced research conducted by the DOD. And most specifically, we looked into the Army, Navy, Air Force, and DARPA. So this is really the forefront of innovation for the U.S. military. It's one of the most exciting, one of the most you know, dynamic areas of uh, science and technology research, and it's all publicly available. So we really could see the way that the, the U.S. military, at least in public sphere is thinking about artificial intelligence and autonomy. And since we already know that human machine teaming is quite fundamental to all of that, uh, all of these efforts, and there is such a big focus, we were expecting to find a decent amount of research that was also focused on trust. And here, let me tell you, this was probably one of the most surprising things in our report. We found that trust is actually mentioned very scarcely. In fact, only 18 out of the 789 research components that we classified as related to autonomy, and only 11 out of the 287 research components that we classified as related to AI, even mentioned the word trust. So that seemed like a very striking gap. And part of the reason that we really delved into that trusted partner study that I mentioned earlier is try to understand what's going on here. Because you see, there's really, you know, it's, it's a bit of a mystery. Human machine teaming is super important in uh, DOD research and DOD thinking about the future of uh, autonomy and AI. And we all know and generally agree that trust is critical, yet it seems that we're not studying it. So what's going on? Excuse me. So basically, we honed down, we narrowed down on two main reasons that we think that what explains this gap in trust research. The first one is that technology has actually outpaced research. 
So technology development is moving faster than research. Much of what we know comes from research that is focused on human trust in automated systems and more traditional expert systems that perform functions that they are scripted to do in a way that, you know, kind of reflects things that we know from industrial automation, from flight controls and autopilots, from areas like that. So these are very different systems from the modern AI systems that learn and adapt to their environments, which are still relatively new. And many of them are you know, still are not fully integrated into um, all of the areas of our lives, but perhaps specifically uh, you know, military affairs. So it makes sense that in that way, there is uh, less research that specifically focuses on these more modern AI and machine-based learning systems. Moreover, a really important point is that a lot of the research that we have on human machine teams is conducted in these controlled lab settings and lab conditions. And that's an important consideration when we're thinking about these modern AI systems that we expect them to learn and to adapt and change based on the interactions with their environments because the more complex an environment is, the more difficult it is for the system to learn and adapt to it, the more changes we're expected to see in it, the more it's going to kind of affect the relationships between human and people. So we really don't know if these findings that we have uh, from lab conditions are going to withstand complex real world conditions and tasks. And moreover, the systems that we have today are still very vulnerable to, uh, you know, they still can't fully function that well outside of these controlled environments. So what happens when they fail? We know to an extent that failure then breaks trust and that makes it hard to resume. So these gaps in research that exist not only in defense research, but are reflected outside in general, um, you know, in the fields that are responsible for studying human approaches to technology can kind of help us understand why the word trust itself is mentioned so scarcely, scarcely and it doesn't look like DOD is directly studying uh, trust in AI or trust in autonomy or trust in you know, human machine teams. The second reason is perhaps even more important for understanding what's going on here. And it stems from the fact that trust is really an abstract, subjective, and very hard to measure concept. And with that in mind, the people that are involved in this, the scientists and the engineers that are building these systems have a preference for working with something more concrete. And these are tech focused solutions that they adopt in efforts to build trust into the system. So you'll hear me talking about system engineering approaches and system engineering approaches to efforts to build trustworthy artificial intelligence, essentially make the claim that trust cultivating capabilities and features and functionalities can in fact be embedded deeply into the fabric of the system. The, all of these trust cultivating capabilities and functionalities can be specified in the original requirements, then they can be implemented in the design, and then they can be certified through testing and evaluation, validation, verification, assurance, all throughout the technology development cycle you can integrate functions and capabilities that make these systems more trustworthy. So you're essentially building trust into the system. So instead of studying trust that again can be abstract, subjective, difficult to measure, difficult to understand, uh, DOD scientists and engineers, and really this is something that we're also very much seeing in the private sector, and I have some examples later if you want to see, they are much more focused on building trust into the system. And I'll talk a little bit by, about some of the functionalities that or these characteristics that are particularly important, starting with an emphasis on reliable and robust AI. So whether AI is reliable and robust is really a sense of trying to ensure that the system can be 
trust it to function properly and predictably as specified. And whether it can operate across these different environments and changing circumstances, and even more so because we're thinking about these systems in military settings, what can it do? Can it withstand adversarial attacks and face adversarial conditions? So reliability is actually perhaps one of the most, if not the most important aspect for developing, calibrating, and maintaining trust in artificial intelligence and autonomous systems. This is in part because we know that trust is very difficult to rebuild after the malfunction. So if a system is not reliable, then it's going to be very hard for me to trust it again after it fails. And reliability really is the foundation of a lot of things. So if you're looking at these pictures here and you're wondering what they all have in common, and it's quite a funny thing what they have in common is that they have all failed quite spectacularly and proved to be unreliable in their jobs, in their missions. So the first picture here is a picture of, a, excuse me, a heavy six-wheeled robot that was meant to be capable of uh, carrying gear for soldiers. So we're talking about both this one and the following picture are essentially robotic mules that are meant to support dismounted soldiers. This first one, though, was also meant to be employed in uh, neutralizing uh, improvised explosive devices, so IEDs, that were causing some of the you know, most casualties in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan at the time. But this program got canceled because the, the robot itself proved unreliable because it really couldn't move as fast as it needed to move. It was too heavy to put on a helicopter, so it couldn't get anywhere that it needed to go. And essentially, it couldn't do the jobs that it was designed to do. The second one was a mule, a robot mule developed for the Marines, also meant to be carrying a load um, you know, to help them as they move. But this one was canceled because it was too loud. So you really can't be deploying with a robot that is too loud and then discloses your location. And finally, the third one, the difference between it, although it also failed quite spectacularly, this is a RON-9, which is an unmanned combat ground vehicle, a Russian one. This one wasn't just developed in experimental conditions or just, you know, as a concept. This one was actually deployed in near urban warfare conditions in Syria. And it didn't do well there at all. It had troubles with communication and navigation, and it couldn't even move and shoot at the same time. And that's pretty much the, the one thing the tank needs to do. It needs to move and shoot at the same time. So, but this one wasn't canceled. Uh, the Russian military is claiming that they're making the necessary changes and then integrating it, making it more reliable, um, making it more robust to uh, functionality to be able to work in different environments and in contested combat setting. So all of these examples really tell us about the challenges to different assets to reliability that we're already seeing in what are remotely operated systems. And even as we're becoming more autonomous and AI enabled, some of these challenges are amplified, right? I'm cognizant of time. So let me kind of quickly explain that in addition to reliability, uh, we're also having to be paying attention to questions of transparency. As well as explainability. So what is the information that uh, the system needs to convey to us in order for increasing situational awareness to supporting better communications between humans and machines and increasing trust? So there is a lot of research on that that shows that more transparent systems tend to be associated with greater levels of trust. Uh, related to that is the question of explainable artificial intelligence. Uh, we're dealing with very advanced and sophisticated systems that people often don't understand, even the people that, you know, design them and uh, then let alone the people then end up deploying them uh, because of their levels of sophistication and this what is known as the black box problem or the opaqueness of AI. Uh, we don't know why they behave the way that they do, even though at times they are very correct and accurate in their decisions and predictions. 
And there is a very wide shared assumptions that in order to have trust, people need to understand how these systems work and why they reach the conclusions that they do. So system engineering approaches are then dedicated to increasing this transparency and uh, developing uh, machine learning and deep learning algorithms that are more explainable and understandable, digestible to humans. The problem is, although it, all of these system engineering approaches are fundamentally necessary for building trust and building trustworthy AI machines, they might not be sufficient in order to establish, cultivate, properly calibrate, and then uh, you know, continue trust in human machine teams. And why is that? For at least two reasons. Let me quickly go over them and then we'll summarize some of our findings here. First of all, we are talking about these futuristic, very sophisticated, very advanced systems that are meant to be learning and changing. And really, if they are going to be useful in combat environments, they do have to learn and change and adopt because the operations environment changes so quickly. So we want these smart technologies to learn and to change and to adapt. But the thing is, as they do, the nature of the human machine interaction, the human machine relationship changes as well, which then of course in turn affects trust. We know that trust is built on repeated interactions. I get to know you, you get to know me, we develop trust as we go and get to know each other better. But the machine changes and learns, it's like a new interaction every time. So even if you build the most reliable, most transparent, the most explainable AI system, Every time these systems change, and every time these systems change hands or change environments, they become new. And the terms that we're dealing on, the relationship between us and these machines also become new. So we have to recalibrate it every single time. So these approaches, again, necessary, but may not be sufficient. And second, again, going back to much of the conversation earlier is that people are different. And these dispositional situational and learned factors all influence trust. So again, if you're, how are you going to ensure that the best AI that you build to work in one human machine team is going to be applicable to the next where the people are different? Even these cultural and institutional factors, they're all going to matter significantly. We know that within different uh, military services, they each have their own culture. They each have their unique approaches to technology. That means that even the speed and the efficiency within which the Department of Defense ends up integrating AI could vary by service or even unit depending on these approaches. And when we're thinking about working with our allies for the United States and its allies, when we're thinking about different national and cultural backgrounds and experiences and how they can impact trust, and we're thinking about working together in multinational operations, there are questions that we should be thinking, you know, for collaboration and interoperability, how some of these differences in, um, you know, inclinations and approaches to trust, how they might manifest themselves. So again, these tech-centric solutions are fundamentally important, but they may not be sufficient. So let me quickly conclude, and then I'll, you know, if you have interest later in the Q&A, we can raise some of the uh, future director for research that we keep thinking, we keep talking about. There really, trust is going to be absolutely critical for the future deployment of human machine teaming and for the future use of AI in military settings and military missions. And that's going to be, uh, you know, I don't think that only applies to the Department of Defense in the United States. I think that was going to be something that is critical to all of the militaries that are going to be implementing uh, human machine teaming and their advanced forms and using AI in their um, weapons and systems. Right now, however, the Department of Defense is not very much focused on understanding trust in and of itself or on focusing on the human element in this human machine teaming equation. And when we're looking at what it is doing, these tech-centric approaches to building trustworthy AI, when they're taking on a loan, there are clear limitations there. 
So really, there are no simple solutions here. And this is an extremely complicated problem. And therefore, no single approach is enough. We're making the very clear, you know, the very simple argument here that it is research and insights from literature on dispositional situation and learned factors that shape trust, as well as a better understanding of the broader and institutional factors and forces that also influence trust and influence our behavior and approach to technology. All of those can inform and strengthen system engineering approaches to building trust for AI and ultimately improving how we deploy human machine teams and use AI in military systems and missions in the future. All right, I'll stop here and I'll just acknowledge that this is my amazing um, CSET team that works on uh, military applications on AI with me and has contributed to the reports that I've highlighted. And this is some of the contact information here. But otherwise, um, Claudia, I'm ready for Q&A if we have some time. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Rita, for this presentation. You've done a great job covering the report. But even though I want to stress to our participants that I highly encourage you to also get acquainted with the report um, in detail and for other work that uh, Rita has published, um, it, it's wonderful material. Um, I would like to just remind participants quickly that you can reuse the chat function if you're using Zoom uh, to communicate your questions to us. I saw that a few have already come in, um, so we're set up for a good discussion uh, session. Um, so I think I'll start, if you don't mind, Rita, with, uh, with uh, a general question first. Um, so a lot of times when we talk or when we read about uh, trust in relation to human uh, machine teaming, um, there is usually this idea of trust in a very individualistic level. Um, and it is, especially in the context of the military as an organization, that this distinction between individualistic or collective approach uh, seems to um, not appear a lot in, in such research. So I just wonder whether this is something that you've also considered when you were doing um, your research and whether you think that there are certain differences that should be addressed in the future areas or future research uh, trajectories. Absolutely, and that's a really good insightful question. And I do actually have a slide that, you know, that kind of reminds us that there are multiple audiences when it comes to trusting artificial intelligence. Much of our focus and the focus in our work has been on the operator or you know, the soldier that is uh, using the artificial intelligence or the autonomous systems or, or whatnot that is directly affected by the relationship. But there are other multiple layers that matter. Everyone up and down the chain of command because everyone is still ultimately responsible for how AI is going to be deployed also need to be engaged in this conversation about trust. Moreover, people in policy positions, people at policy development, policy regulation, policy enforcement, all of them also have to be engaged in the conversation about trust. And finally, especially in democratic countries where there is civilian oversight over the military, there's the question of public trust, right? Our, our society needs to be on board on with you know the the types of weapons and systems uh, we employ and how we fight uh, our wars and, uh, and and really a lot of these conversations about autonomous weapons and artificial intelligence, of course, it's a question where of course these are questions where the public should have a say. Uh, so you're definitely right. Like uh, audience, there are multiple audiences and it's a multi layered conversation. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'll jump into some of the questions that are already posed by mm -hmm. our participants. Um, so the first one, and I see that one that is also re uh, repeatedly asked is when and how to measure trust. So um, here our participant asks, when you refer to too much trust or too little trust, how do you quantify the thresholds that you, that you want to determine for a specific system or a specific operation? 
Of course, yeah. And that's, you know, that's part of the reason why there's such a push and such of an emphasis on these uh, more technology centered and software oriented solutions is because measuring trust is very difficult. And there are different approaches to measuring trust. Really, it's very hard to measure trust directly. We tend to measure uh, manifestations that are related to trust. So things that kind of measure your heart rate or how focused you are, your levels of anxiety or your level, like even eye movements, things like that, that kind of show whether you, if you're at ease or if you're anxious, um, signal to us if you're trusting the technology that you're working with or not. Uh, Another very common way in research to measure trust is through questionnaires and surveys that kind of lead to self-assessment of how you feel and how you perceive and how you interact with uh, the technology at hand. But again, there's there's uh, problems there because self self assessment can be uh, you know it can be inaccurate and there's like some questions over bias. There's a lot of uh, different indexes that researchers have developed to kind of understand where people stand on trust and trying to operationalize that in different way. In the end of the day, I think questions of too much or too little, again, uh, it's contingent on what the technology can do at a given point in time. So that's that's the appropriate calibration of trust is an interaction. It's a, it's a give and take where you learn what the technology can do and what it cannot do. And from there, you kind of adjust your expectations and uh, your interactions with it, given also considering the conditions around you. But yeah, there's no, there's no easy, there's no easy way around that. Yeah, and it's a related question. Uh, you may be aware of the idea of trust marks, uh, so to say certification systems uh, that certify systems that are trustworthy. Um, so I'm wondering, and it's related to the response that you were just providing as well, where do you think that such a certification system of trust marks would be something that could help us um, assess these systems before deployment or acquisition? For sure. And uh, I'm not, maybe I'm missing the exact terminology here, but I assume it's one that kind of goes around those elements uh, um, of trustworthy AI or trustworthy systems that I discussed. Is it reliable? Is it transparent? Do I know where the data from uh, came from? Do I know if it's private, if it's secure, if it's uh, safe to use, if it's, you know, been developed ethically and whatnot. So if it meets all of these parameters of how we define um, reliable, trustworthy artificial intelligence, then it can receive high trust marks and whatnot and be, uh, you know, considered a trustworthy systems. Uh, if that if that is the case, then I think it, it's, it's critically important. It's definitely part of the conversation, but I think it once again gets to this focus on the machine side of the human machine relationship and the human machine interaction. And that is a very important side to get right, of course, but you still are dealing with at least half of the relationship where you have to account for how is the human going to be and going to interact and behave. And then the the in between the interaction because the interaction itself also changes both the human and if it's a learning machine, the machine itself. So it's it's definitely trust marks is it sounds like a good approach, but I think it will probably fall into one of those necessary but not sufficient um, challenges. Yeah. So if I understand correctly, you say it might oversimplify the complexity of what we mean here by trust in such complex relationships. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know enough to, about it to say that, uh, that, that you know, to <laughs> talk about its shortcomings, but it's, it's a complicated topic for sure. And it's one that you have to be addressing all the elements of the relationship to get it right. Mm. All right, let's take another question from the audience. Um, this is a question from Gabriel, Gabriel Pierini from the NATO Special Operations Headquarters. Um, and she's asking, being a domain in which a high level of trust is required, in your opinion, to what extent will special operations forces benefit from AI? Would you please provide us with a couple of examples, she asks. 
Oh, okay, sure. So I think special operation forces are really interesting, and you'll forgive me if I don't have very concrete examples, but what's interesting about special operation forces is that they are very experimental in their culture, and they're very adaptable. So I think they will be, and they are, at least, you know, at least in the United States, they're already experimenting uh, with a lot of artificial intelligence uh, enabled tools and some, and they're even taking them into the field, into their operations, which many other units are not doing. And in that way, they're both learning what the systems can and cannot do, and then also taking that feedback back to the developers, back to the scientists, in order to make sure that, you know, as these uh, tools evolve, they become more usable, more reliable, more, you know, explainable, whatever it is that uh, the special operations forces need from them. So I think that on the one way, like that, what you will see from the special operation forces will perhaps be your best case scenario because you are talking about a population that is extremely adaptable. So if we're talking, if we're going to be looking at their, you know, marks and how they score on these personality traits of adaptability, of openness, of like ability to kind of function after uh, under high levels of stress and high levels of complexity, you are probably dealing with special people. Uh, so they might be your best case scenario for developing uh, effective human machine teaming. But again, that is only one part of the larger military establishment within which you will see different cultures, different approaches, different speeds of adaptability, different inclinations of trust. And if you are seeking to scale AI across the entire force, then you will have to be accounting for those differentiations. I hope that, you know, kind of answers the questions and helps make sense. Yeah, and a follow up also to this question is, of course, the question of given these, um, this complexity of what we mean by trust in the military context, uh, especially with AI. Uh, you've also pointed that out in your presentation that there are a lot of challenges here to be able to calibrate well trust because we we need the sometimes human judgment. We value it as has been shown in many, um, many publications and international debates. Um, but at the same time, there's something that we want to benefit from when AI is in those operations, right? Um, so I'm wondering whether um, you could talk us through some of the examples or maybe cases in which you think um, that the conditions are desirable to develop trustworthy systems or whether there are situations or circumstances in which maybe having trustworthy AI would be conflicting with some moral, uh, legal, or even strategic goals um, that you might have in, in those situations? Mm. So I don't know. It's hard to think about the other, you know, that last part, whether having trustworthy AI could conflict. I think at the end of the day, it's not up to the systems and the machines. It's up to us, uh, the humans, in order to decide how we use them and then ensure that we use them in accordance with moral and legal and, uh, you know, obligations and then our broader strategic goals for sure. But I think you are correct to hit on the point about the levels of trust and the complexities and what you, people need from the systems in order to use them effectively would probably vary depending whether they are employed in combat or whether they're employed in much safer conditions like for you know back office operations or something like that. So for something like back office operations, maybe I will care more about the transparency of the system and ensuring that there's higher levels of data privacy and data security than I would about you know different dimensions. But when we're talking about uh, taking a system into the field, uh, I would care more about reliability more than anything uh, to, because I, let's say I probably would care more about reliability rather than explainability, because I care that it works 
And as long as it's working, maybe I don't care as much about why it's doing the things it's doing as long as it's working the way that I need it to work. So I think these interactions between the different components, uh, between the different aspects of trust, whether it's reliability, robustness, transparency, security, safety, like a lot of these aspects that then feed into trust and help kind of help people understand how to relate to technology, uh, the interactions between them are very important and they would, again, vary depending on the audience, depending on the interaction between human and machines, depending on the setting. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of ways that you can approach it and it will all matter. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have uh, another question from the floor, and this is in relation to training. Um, so uh, our participant asks, how much technical training do you think the common soldier will need uh, in order to work with AI? Yeah, so that's that's not an easy question, right? That's one of the big ones that is being asked right now. It's like how much computer literacy you're going to need, how much, uh, you know, actual you know, coding skills or whatnot, and how much do you really need to understand about artificial intelligence in order to use some of those systems effectively? So I think it's going to vary. I think some of the operators that are going to be using these systems, depending where they sit, if they're, if, if these are, you know, people that are processing intelligence and then uh, they're probably not likely to be the same people that make the decisions about targeting. So the people that, but the people that process intelligence based on uh, AI algorithms need to have a good explanation of what happened and how they reach certain conclusions when they take those recommendations to the people that then make certain targeting decisions based on that intelligence, let's say it like that. For the people operating on the ground, if they're in charge of coordinating, let's say drones and uh, ground vehicles all through an interactive device that they have in hand? Do they need to know the precise ways these systems are synced? Perhaps not necessarily, but it's important to also remember at the time that whatever knowledge you're surrendering, you're also kind of surrendering some of the control. And if you were ever to lose control or if the systems ever were ever to malfunction or things like that, then you are inevitably left in potentially a worse condition because you have become increasingly reliant on some of these technologies. And then, you know, it ends up driving you into a lake. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um... I'm going to ask you another question from the participants um, and add on to it. So uh, we have a question from uh, Mr. Keyes Neuenhaus, uh, who's asking if trust is such a complex quantity that can vary over time rapidly, is it humanly possible to cope with different trust levels over the interaction period with an AI based system? Um, and I may just add to it also, if it's such a complex, um, complex topic or concept that we're bringing up here as well, um, to what extent is it also useful for us to bring it in um, this uh, this field of study? So, uh, but go ahead first and, and answer uh, Mr. Newen's, Newenhaus question. Um, that's a fair question, right? So there are those that make an argument that because of this complexity as well and, and as systems become, you know, so machines become more intelligent and you have real-time learning and online learning, uh, then uh, soldiers and operators will be less likely to trust them and therefore less likely to employ them. Um, and that's really kind of, there are some ways to uh, moderate some of that challenge, but you can't ever fundamentally solve it just because that's the nature of trust and it's complex. Uh, on the other hand, again, a lot of it is going to vary about which task we end up using AI for and uh, what are the periods of time where the decision that is being guided by AI 
uh, needs to be made. So the longer those uh, tractions of times, the more possibility we have to use AI and make some more informed decisions that we kind of you know, moderate for the problems that arise. Uh, Claudia, to your question about whether we should be studying trust uh, directly, especially from the human approaches uh, to technology perspective, because even though it is so complex, I think absolutely fundamentally, yes, because uh, there are ways to, this information will help us ensure that the tech-centric approaches and the system engineering approaches for designing trustworthy AI are properly taking into account the fact that people are different, that cultures are different, that things change with time depending on experience. All of this is important. So even if it's hard, it's still critical. And if we don't account for it, then there is an important gap that we are kind of leaving on the table. This is wonderful that you're leaving us with these thoughts. Um, and I think just last two questions then to also leave us on thinking, what can we do about it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, given all that you've, you've left us with. So this uh, touches on also the question that was brought up by uh, Taylor Woodcock, who is also, um, uh, she's a PhD candidate at the Astro Institute. And so she's also asking um, what, the role of law would be here as well in the in in the question of trust, and I know this may not have been maybe uh, precisely within the scope of your paper, but maybe you will have also a few words to say here. So, uh, how can legal tools be used to operationalize these notions of trust, and and how can we uh, use them to in, uh, to some respect um, influence the way trust is uh, designed or uh, in the EAI systems in the military context? Okay, yeah, I mean, so law is definitely beyond my realm of expertise, but I will say that because these, you know, uh, these different components of trust and different uh, systemic or system related features, uh, there's absolutely role for law to play to ensure that they're more trustworthy and something like uh, what sort of data goes into machine learning algorithms uh, and then feeds into, you know, recommendation systems. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity for legal tools to regulate the type of data uh, governments and companies have access to and what they then use with that data. There's a lot of legal tools that can regulate and which realm of military operations AI can be used or which, uh, you know, not even just the military, but can Homeland Security use AI, can uh, police use AI and how so. That's where a lot of the legal tools, you know, just governance comes in as well. Uh, I think there's definitely a role to play for legal tools. You just have to kind of go down um, each and every one of these uh, components and try to understand how the law can apply there in order to you know, ensure and regulate uh, for best outcomes. Yeah, thank you, Rita. And probably last but not least is also amongst um, our participants, we have a lot of researchers that are working in different fields, right? From uh, some of them more on the technical side, others, as you just uh, saw on the legal, uh, but also social and ethical sides of, of things. Um, and as it seems from your presentation, trust very nicely touches upon many, many of these different fields. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could leave us with some of your thoughts of directions for future research that you mentioned in your presentation, you'd like to also indicate. So uh, maybe you have a few words to inspire us at the end of this talk where, where we should go from here. Absolutely. And uh, if you, you know, if you go to the paper itself, there's like a really, you know, an elaborate discussion of where some gaps remain and where things can be really useful. But I would say that to me, there are two areas that I think really need uh, useful research, especially given the audience, uh, you know, around the virtual table here today. One of them is collaborative research with allied countries in order to understand how our culturally impacted different approaches to working with intelligence systems might influence our ability to work with one another. So if the United States is faster to adopt certain systems, certain AI-enabled systems across different ranges of its military operations, 
what does this mean for NATO? What does it mean for our uh, allies in the Asia Pacific? Like, how are we going to be working together if we have different approaches and different tendencies to work with technologies? So that's one area is this um, collaborative research and what it means to be allies in a world of AI. And the second research is an area that is just very curious to me and it is the interaction or the intersect, intersection of reliability and explainability. What do I need to know if my system is working? And what can help me regain trust in my system if it failed? So how important is explainability at the presence of a highly reliable system? And how can explainability help me regain trust? So I think this intersection is really important because we keep you know, touching on both of them, but we're not always thinking about the fact that these two can kind of shape each other and track with one another. Um, so hopefully that kind of you know, stimulates some uh, brilliant young minds and get you guys going. <laughs> I'm sure it will. Um, thank you very much, Rita, for this wonderful lecture and wonderful engagement with the questions and also to our participants for engaging and, and posing those questions in the chat and engaging with us in the discussion. Um, I'm, I'm really glad in that, that you joined us and uh, we're already also looking forward to some of your future research also on this topic as I'm sure that you'll uh, follow on um, and, and we'll sh uh, see soon more publications on this topic from your side. Um, just as a last matter of uh, um, information for our participants is that we already encourage you to register for our next dilemma lecture that will take place on the 12th of April. Uh, it will be with uh, Peter Paul Farbeck. Um, it will be on the topic of artificial intelligence and ethical disruption. So you can already uh, go to our website on theaster.nl slash dilemma, where you'll find more information. And among others, you'll also find an opening for a postdoctoral researcher with us um, with the Dilemma Project. So I highly encourage you to engage with our content and thank you all very much for joining us today. And special thank you to you, Margarita. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.